Cabernet tends to be the sort of Errol Flynn of the great varieties. One of Australia's leading beer judges. People always ask, how do you get involved in sake and how does that connect to music? Because wine is an adventure. Conventional winemakers who just condemn all natural wine as faulty. The prestigious title of sake samurai. Looking at whiskey in more of an artful culinary way. The difference between getting good quality fresh hops, it just translates straight through into the beer. This is the Drinks Adventures podcast. I'm James Atkinson. And this is the show where I speak to some of the world's most exciting producers of beer, wine and spirits and uncover trends and issues in the drinks industry today. Were it not for the coronavirus pandemic, recent weeks would have seen about 6 million people from all over the world descend on Munich for the Oktoberfest. This is the first year since World War II that Oktoberfest, the world's biggest beer festival, has not gone ahead. The closest you'll get in 2020 is Oktoberfest Beer and Blood, the TV series that was a smash hit in Germany and is now being shown globally by Netflix. The lead character in the series is Kurt Prank, whose story is loosely based on the life of a man named George Lang, who had an important role in shaping the Oktoberfest as we know it today. Finland-born Hannu Salonen is the director of the series, and he joins us in this opening episode of Season 7 of the Drinks Adventures podcast. In a moment, you'll hear from Hanu how the series was conceived. What I love about Australian craft spirits is that our distillers are truly free to experiment. We aren't governed by rules and traditions. That's why the flavour and character of Australian spirits is so unique. But it takes distilling prowess and another critical ingredient to bring these products to market. And that ingredient is Bintani. Bintani supplies distillers with malts of all colours, flavours and aromas. They have a leading range of yeast and other ingredients and the professional expertise to help distillers create the spirits of their dreams. Make Bintani your partner in taste and quality. Übrig bleibt, ist es, was übrig bleibt, wann die Sonne auf Wiesen scheint, wann die Sonne auf Wiesen scheint, rot, blau, schwarz, grau, gelb ist es, was übrig bleibt, wann's Blut unter der Haut fällt. The inciting incident is basically one guy that really did exist, who was a um, brewer, but he was also a bordello owner, and he was an entertainer in a way. His name was George Lang. And our Kurt Prank is based on this character. And this Kurt, um, Kurt Prank, uh, George Lang guy, had this dream and, and this vision of building a huge tent for 6,000 people on the Oktoberfest. Now, you have to know, it was totally impossible for an outsider to, to operate business-wise on the Oktoberfest. In our case, Kurt Brandt actually um, originates from Berlin, even further in the north, even more impossible to just go to Bavaria and operate there. And it doesn't matter what kind of vision you have, they just wouldn't let you. But this real guy, George Lang, actually managed to do it. He had to get like five other people in breweries, they had to get rid of them. So uh, this leads to some violence and bloodshedding. And the violence and bloodshedding, that's where a little bit of the more fictional aspects come in? Oh, yes, of course. There are actually two characters that this is based on, but of course we are not even taking the, the real names because it's highly, highly fictional because we wanted to reach, I would call it like a biblical Shakespearean level of conflict and drama. And that, of course, uh, we're in, quite that way in, in real life, um, but we have to, have to get there. So obviously this is a combination of, of some facts and, and a lot of fiction. Um, but I have to say, as to the production design and the costumes, it's really well researched, very well researched even, and that's very truthful. How did the project eventuate? How did you become involved? Two of my producers actually originate from Munich and they notice that no one has done anything about the October, about the historical one. And the Germans actually don't even know much about the history of the Oktoberfest. So it hasn't been a topic here at all. And they were searching for an intriguing character 
perhaps, or something, something interesting from that time. That time was very interesting because a lot of things were changing here. The whole capitalism and the, the artist scene uh, in Munich, a lot of things were happening. Famous people were there. So it's, it's like the, 20, the golden 20s in Berlin or, or New York were like uh, actually 20 years earlier in Munich. And it was, it was a very interesting time. That's why they start, you know, started digging a little bit deeper. And they actually found, came up with this character. Um, I got involved as they called me. I was just editing my Nordic show, Arctic Circle, in Helsinki, Finland. And they called me and pitched the project. And um, first I was a bit skeptical in a way because I was thinking, you know, okay, where are the conflicts? But then I read the outlines of Ronnie Schalk and Christian, uh, Christian Lima. And I was totally convinced. I just fell in love with this thing uh, totally because then it was obvious it was called Beer and Blood. That was the, the working title. And it exactly was the core of the whole show. And it was like um, totally something for me. The series aired some time ago in Germany. How was it received? The German broadcasters they actually told me they were afraid to lose the white German hetero man over 60. <laughs> I, I just you know, have to laugh a little bit about that, but that's why they took another approach. They even, by the way, so that you know, in the first episode, we have this loose head in the river and this kind of like Indiana Samoa girl picks it up. They, they cut that whole thing off because they didn't want the audience to see. They were anxious about the whole thing in a way. The age of the audience, of these public broadcasters, is like 65. And our aim and our peer groups were much, much younger. I didn't make this basically this show for quite so old people, perhaps. And then it's, it went online into a so-called Mediatek, which is like the online internet TV of these public broadcasters. And there we already have something like 9, 10 million in two weeks. It's like a bomb. It was just something totally different that they, um, until then, this Mediatek was just, you know, nobody was really using it. And suddenly it took off. And those were just the younger audiences that basically found us via internet, obviously, and not, you know, through the classical area. What was Oktoberfest like prior to the events of 1900 when Jorg Lang decided that he wanted to introduce these huge beer castles or beer tents? The Oktoberfest was totally different. It used to be more like a farmer's show where the farmers took their cows and bulls along with a horse race, this type of thing, and people drinking beer in little wooden huts, you know, for 40, 50 people perhaps, with a fiddler or a piano, lonesome piano guy um, in the corner playing some piano more like a Western saloon in a way. Actually, it would be a saloon, and you have something like 50 to 70 of these saloons on that big um, area, Oktoberfest, Theresienwiese. And it was, of course, quite harsh harsh life for a lot of people, uh, like the beer model girls that were actually carrying beer there. Slowly, it turned into more like a um, circus type of thing in a way. And they had also so-called Völkerschau, which actually means that they brought some people from poor countries like uh, German Samoa to present them a little bit like animals. They actually were even in chains. We couldn't do that. Uh, we didn't put them in chains, but they, in the real life uh, was different there. Uh, so this was the Oktoberfest. It might have been a lot of people, but nothing like this big beer tent or the big band or anything like this, which uh, George Lang came up with. So basically, the events that happened in, in 1900 and this gentleman who had these, you know, who had these ideals, that, did he sort of really essentially shape what has become the current Oktoberfest as we all know it? He has totally, George Lang, or, or, or like they said in German, Georg Lang, um, actually changed everything in, in, a lot of, in a lot of senses because he was really the master entertainer. And he, he didn't compose the, the song himself, but he let it be composed by a composer. Uh, it's an, this is until today the most famous drinking song, Prosit auf Gemütlichkeit, um, like cheers to the uh, coziness, I would like you know, translate it. A cheers to the coziness, uh, and he and this is until today. That's like the drinking song here. Uh, 
And here's the idea with a big band having this, like I've, even more than in the show. In the show, we have, I, I guess, like like 18 people, but these these big bands are like then 30 people or something. And until that, you know, there was just a, like a lonely, lonesome piano man in the in the in the, in the corner playing something. So this changed everything. It was like a big show that actually just wanted the people drinking as much beer as possible until they fall. That was his idea, basically. He was a really good businessman. <laughs> and, and he managed, you know, to do that. And that changed, obviously, that changed everything. Because a couple of years after that, they already had these seven, eight big tents that are there still today, by the way. Um, also, not really, it's not a really free market that you can just go on until today. It's quite, um, how, how, would, how would you say it? It's not, you just don't go there and have a business or so. So it's basically more or less the same that it used to be, um, uh, even today. But he, yes, he changed it. Do you think he's had, you know, enough credit or enough recognition for having done that? Totally not. No one, no one knew this guy. Well, actually, there is in, in the Munich Beer Museum, in, right in the center of Munich, there is a little small picture of this guy. Um, but this is, it's not really stressed that he changed everything. There is a kind of like hush up about this. Uh, still, because he was a non-Munich man, he wasn't from from there, and he wasn't foreign foreigner in that sense. Even in our show, it's like a foreigner because Prussia was like a foreign country. The northern territories in Germany were so different from Bavaria. He was like a total foreigner. You now, through our show in Germany, um, his name has popped up, you know, and people have, have been starting to, to to write about him because he's quite fascinating character anyway. Has the show sort of? you know, started a lot of debate and discussion in Germany about this chapter of history and, you know, how faithful your show was to those events? That's a very good question, by the way, because this exactly hits the, the head of the nail a little bit for me. My aim and the aim of my teammates here it was totally clear that we are not making a documentary here. Of course, it has certain dimensions to it that are very um, different from a realistic way of, you know, uh, approaching this theme, and that is something that is not very typical in Germany in that sense. And I knew because it, it is really a holy thing in a way. It was totally clear to me that there are going to be some, you know, different opinions about this. I would say <laughs> um, because some Germans perhaps expect it to be a realistic and totally truthful treatment of this historical setting, more like an observation. So it's quite different, you know, but it's, of course, it means that you take some risks. Um, people might not, you know, like it or they might expect something else, but actually that goes for anything you ever make. If it's historical, people start, you know, looking at it and say, hey, well, God, come on, it's not exactly like that or whatever. This episode of Drinks Adventures is supported by Fever Tree Premium Mixers, the mixer of choice in the world's best bars and restaurants. Right now, I'm enjoying Fever Tree's Mediterranean tonic for a more delicate touch on some of the fine Australian gins you've heard discussed on the show. I suppose it's a coincidence that the show happens to be launching in Australia and I suppose rest of the world as well at a time when it's the first year in however long where there hasn't actually been an Oktoberfest. That's really amazing and that was never ever our... couldn't even imagine that. After the Second World War, the first year that it doesn't take place. So it's really amazing. And now people are really suffering from this financially that it doesn't take place. Not so much the big, big beer tents, because they have been earning money quite well over the years. They are actually like the mighty guys here. Uh, they might, you know, survive quite okay. <laughs> but the rest of them, yeah. the small people, you know, selling all this stuff and, and entertaining the kids, there are a lot of them, thousands and thousands. Those are the people that, of course, are badly suffering from not being able to have anything this year. In the series, there's some pretty incredible scenery and some really beautiful castles. Is it all shot in Bavaria? No, we actually shot um, lots of the stuff of the Oktoberfest was shot in Prague because you could find this place, this old train station that we could build the Oktoberfest on, partially, obviously, digitally, but partially we, we needed, it, obviously, physically, a huge set. And they had to be in the town because we needed all these extras, like hundreds of them, hundreds and hundreds, and they, we couldn't be outside of the city because you had to carry all these people to get there somehow. And in Czech Republic, we also found 
the old brewery. The actual brewery is like f five different sets and five different locations in two countries. But the real one that you see there is actually in the Czech Republic. It's a beer country and you could find this stuff and you don't find it in Germany in that quality anymore. Either it's too clean and it's like a museum and you can't use it or you just build it or whatever, which is really, really expensive then again. So we did actually shoot in Bavaria. Yes, we did, but we didn't don't probably didn't shoot the stuff that you might expect us because you, you can't really. Even Munich City is not, you just don't, you can't really shoot there because it doesn't look like Munich at that time. So <laughs> that's really funny. We actually, um, a lot of the castles and so on, we shot in Nordrhein-Westfalen, is the Nordrhein-Westfalia, which is like Cologne in that area. There are really nice castles. So all the castles actually are in Germany, yes. And the Oktoberfest stuff is in Czech Republic. You mentioned about, you know, expense being a consideration. It looks like it would have been a very expensive production. That's really, it's really funny. It is always like the... The silver lining of having not so much money is that you have to really get, you really have to you know be be well prepared because you have to kind of like compensate this a um, little bit at least because the normal American show or even an English one like Peak Blinders they have a multitude of more money <laughs> that but it mustn't show you know that we have kind of like have to hide it in a way so. We're constantly trying to optimize these things because we didn't have that much, like, uh, for the visual effects, for example. Even in Prague, you know, with modern buildings, how to get them off and how not to show them behind the the setting, for example, which, you know, sounds very banal, but it's really like the truth is the modern buildings are there. So using smoke and these kind of things was really essential to the whole thing that we actually get it done the way that it can be financed by the producers. Yeah, it looked like big, but but obviously it's not quite that big because the Germans, German and European budgets normally don't, um, they don't fit really the ideas or the visual ideas that, for example, I have. So that's, of course, a little bit of a uh, <laughs> dilemma. Look, I haven't actually finished watching the series yet, so I don't know how it finishes, but did you leave it open to make another season? And is that possible? Oh, yes. There are a lot of conflicts that are totally open uh, it's more or less just the beginning. I, I, don't, I don't think really we, we are going to make several seasons, but there might be a second and, and third one because there are, it's just beginning and, and we have plenty of stuff uh, to, be, to be told there. It hasn't been greenlit yet because it's, of course, also the German broadcasters that are, I'm not, you know, a little bit uncomfortable perhaps with this product in a way although it's very successful, but it's not there. So they kind of feel it's more like Netflix. If it's successful on Netflix, then Netflix might, you know, just continue financing it somehow. But also the German broadcasters are still a part of it. But they kind of like feel uncomfortable in a way with this thing. It's just too radical for them. So um, let's see. Let's see what happens. Do the German broadcasters tend to be a bit more conservative with yes. their content? Yes, absolutely. I, I guess you must have you know, done a, done a lot of research yourself and I'm assuming that you, you must certainly have attended Oktoberfest. Does it live up to what you, would, what you expected Oktoberfest would be like? I think it's even more than that. It's really mind-blowing. It's just huge. And, and it's, you know, it's really nice, especially now where we are not able to get together and because of the uh, COVID-19 and whatever, you just notice how much people actually do miss being together being physical, touch things, smelling, drinking, whatever. It is like life. And this lot of life it might even be that the whole evening's a bit too much life at the end. <laughs> but it's really, um, I would welcome it. Uh, obviously, um, we need it. And you just notice when you don't have it, you really do notice how you, you start missing it. Thank you so much for joining me on the show. Thanks a lot. It was my pleasure. Die ganze Stadt ist auf den The Drinks Adventures podcast is produced by me, James Atkinson, with additional production and mixing by Dave Robertson. You can find complete transcripts, links, and other information on the show at drinksadventures.com.au. 
You can follow me on all social media platforms at by James Atkinson. Like my Facebook page, James Atkinson Drinks Adventures, to be kept informed of podcast giveaways and other news about the show. The Drinks Adventures podcast needs your support as listeners. Please do us a favour and leave an honest review and rating for the podcast on iTunes or Stitcher. We love hearing your feedback and it helps inform other people this is a show worth listening to. Or simply drop us a line at hello at drinksadventures.com.au.